I'm Darius Kosiauskas. I am a scientist at NREL. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to talk about my research. Um, if I would like to make sure that you can hear me all right and you can see my screen all right. Please let me know if, if, if there are some issues right now or during the presentation. Uh, so this presentation is at the Next Generation Photovoltaic Center, and before going to uh, the, the technical kind of things that I do in the lab, I wanted to, to find uh, a broad overview slide. So here is the one. Uh, there was a recent workshop at NREL attended by scientists from four continents, and a summary of that workshop a large group of authors wrote a paper in science, cited here at the bottom left, uh, terawatt scale photovoltaics transforming global energy. So uh, this uh, kind of sets a very high bar for research uh, uh, that we all do. And here is the one slide summary. So currently in the world, uh, there is more than 500 gigawatt PV uh, generation capacity installed. Hello. Hello. Hi, hi, Darius. Sorry to interrupt. Just one moment. It looks like um, at least one person is having some audio difficulty trying to find out uh, more. Just one moment. Thank you. How about now? Huh, it looks like they're having some difficulty hearing you. You're coming through loud and clear on my end. Um, just yes. just one moment. Let, let me, they're, they're typing in the chat window. One moment. Thank you. Well, uh, uh, Darius, how about you, um, I, I guess I would suggest that you just continue on with the talk and uh, we'll see if maybe maybe they can adjust their audio on their end. Uh, uh, but I would I would suggest just to proceed and, and we'll figure it out. <laughs> Thanks. I, uh, I, I, I use my phone, maybe that would help for others as well. I had difficulties with my computer, but it works fine on my phone. So uh, here is the, the, the summary of the current uh, PV and its potential. Uh, uh, half a terawatt of PV is currently installed. Uh, one terawatt will be installed in the next three years. Uh, that is enabled by 100 billion global, indust billion global industry. And in the United States, almost 2% of electricity now is photovoltaics. But if you look at the graph on the left, uh, the, the energy that is needed in the world is rapidly increasing. Uh, it doubled over the 50 years. And furthermore, the dashed line, which is electricity, is not increasing as rapidly as the overall energy use. So uh, uh, to make an impact to the, cl to the climate change uh, and other global challenges, much more electricity and much more solar electricity is needed. So the participants of, of this workshop uh, discussed different possibilities and suggested that perhaps in the increased electrification of industry and transportation 
which is shown in uh, the shaded area in both graphs, uh, could enable uh, mitigation, some of these global challenges. Now, what that means in PV is that the PV needs transition from the dashed line to the solid uh, line, which is the 10 times larger scale. So uh, people who are working uh, in, on the next generation photovoltaics uh, and related areas should probably ge ge be get real busy <laughs> so that in, in the, the efforts could produce 10 times more result uh, in a, as little as 10 years. Now currently, uh, uh, this is the, the, the recordings of the PV development in the United States over the 21st century. So in the first 10 years up to 2010, uh, the amount of PV was approximately constant, and there was also a large variation between the, the, the winter and the summer by a factor of 10. Uh, the exponential growth started from 2010, and in 10 years, the installed PV capacity in the U.S. has doubled. Also, the seasonal variations have decreased. Uh, they are large, but they are uh, not on the order of magnitude. Uh, this is enabled by the rapid decrease in cost, uh, whereas today uh, the PV is one of the least expensive energy generation technologies. Uh, the, the cost of, of, of PV is, is, is proportional to the, to the uh, utility power price. Uh, when we look at uh, the, 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 the states, which say states generate most renewable energy, um, uh, 10 of them generate more than 20% of electricity from solar and, and wind. Uh, I learned actually that, that Colorado may be the second or the third in this list. Uh, California is first with 18% of, of energy generated from, from solar, which is similar to Germany. Uh, and two coal states, Vermont and Minnesota, actually are not, not too far. Uh, so all of this is enabled by the, by the silicon PV technology, which is very good and dominant today. Uh, the question, though, is if silicon PV can be scaled uh, 10 times and also if, if there are opportunities for other technologies. Uh, this, the charts on the left are from the Bloomberg Energy Finance, uh, which shows uh, the investment, the money spent uh, uh, for clean energy. So the PV is, is, is yellow, and uh, the investment in PV is about $100 uh, billion dollars over the last decade. Uh, uh, the interesting thing is that, however, because of uh, um, improved efficiency, reliability, larger scale, and reduced cost, in 2011, uh, that $150 billion for bought about 30 gigawatts of PV while in 2018, less money bought 110 gigawatts of PV. That's, that's an example uh, of this uh, exponential growth. Uh, we do research, and perhaps some students are listening as well, so the, 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 the jobs aspect, the research jobs aspect is very important. So here is the summary from, from a PV Tech website. Uh, which shows that uh, um, about $1 billion a year is spent on PV R&D. So 1% of, of, the, of the total investment in PV is the research investment. It's not very high percentage, actually, comparing to other technologies. Uh, now, the, the, the first two bars in this chart, the bottom uh, two ones, is the first solar and sun power, where the, the research investment uh, put together is in the order of 20 to $200 million uh, a year. Uh, now, the decreasing PV cost is enabled by more efficient and reliable modules. Uh, I'm not sure if everybody has noticed that, that NREL now also uh, makes this champion module efficiency chart, and not only the small uh, cell uh, efficiency chart. And uh, the blue color here is silicon. And we, as we can see from about uh, 95 to today, uh, silicon module efficiency has increased from about 20% to about 24%. Now, this is very good, uh, but it's surely not a revolutionary progress to go from 20% to 24%. Uh, 
The SNP technology develops slightly faster. Uh, uh, the first uh, um, uh, results for, from photon energy uh, on this chart are about 8%. Uh, today, uh, uh, these results are in the order of 19%, so about two times faster growth uh, than that of, of silicon. Uh, now, more efficient modules are enabled by more efficient research solar cells. This is a very busy chart. Everybody is familiar with it, so we don't need to consider the details. Uh, the blue is silicon, uh, the green are thin film technologies, um, a small area cadmium telluride solar cells are 22% efficient, CHGS 23% efficient, uh, perovskite 24% efficient. Uh, the, the modules are about 19% for CHGS and cadmium telluride, that is there is about 4% gap uh, between the modules and the solar cells, so making more efficient solar cells then enables uh, more efficient, more, more reliable modules. Uh, of course, the, the underlying uh, reasons uh, why these efficiencies are not yet highest possible is that semiconductors have defects, and these defects cause recombination losses. Uh, so the, the goal of the research to understand these defects, to eliminate them, or at least to, to mitigate them impact. Uh, the uh, illustrations on the left are uh, two typical solar cell device tag. The first one is cadmium's uh, telluride solar cell device tag, uh, as fabricated and published by researchers at uh, Colorado State University. Uh, it's very thin, just several micron thick structure, but it's complicated. It has uh, the, the, the glass, the CO, the buffer layer, a complicated uh, and graded absorber, as well as the bare contact. Uh, the structure in the middle is the AGS. In this case, it's the uh, a direct electron microscopy image, uh, which shows uh, uh, about three micron uh, thick uh, uh, absorber, copendium gallium selenide, where the columnar grains uh, propagate across the, the, the film uh, thickness. And now these are uh, complicated uh, structures uh, with uh, uh, very uh, many different um, aspects uh, uh, for the analysis that I do for electro-optical characterization. I simplify these type of structures into the cartoon shown on the right. Uh, so here we see the, 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 the two um, contact or buffer layers in yellow. Uh, the front interface that needs to be transparent and the back interface that does not have to be transparent, although it could be. Uh, then there are the grain boundaries, uh, the regions between the crystalline grains in the material, as well as the absorber bulk. So we, we are trying to identify defects that are present in these specific device locations, as well as the impact on solar cell efficiency and reliability. Uh, here is the a uh, more detailed description of, of, of the same cartoon. Uh, so the interfaces that include the front interface, the back interface, and the grain boundary interface are described by recombination velocities. Uh, and they're called velocities because they're measured in centimeters per second. Uh, these values can range from 1, 10 to the 7th. 10 to the 7th would be as fast as electrons can um, move, are moving in semiconductor. One would be uh, the current um, passivation records, uh, which are achieved in both gallium arsenide, uh, two six semiconductors, um, and, and, and other materials. Uh, for, for the bulk, uh, the concept that is used is the carrier lifetime, memory carrier lifetime, tau bulk, uh, as well as uh, doping and mobility. Uh, so uh, ultimately, both the recombination velocity S and the inverse of the lifetime, which is the recombination rate, are uh, described are proportional to the defect density per volume or per area, uh, and then the, the, the proportionality constants capture cross-section and thermal velocity. So uh, if we know the, the bulk lifetime, if we know the recombination velocity, it means we know defect densities. We also want to identify these defects. Uh, that is difficult from experiments that I do, uh, but uh, theory collaboration sometimes allow us to assign defects from spectra. So what I'm trying to do in the lab, instead of the sun, I'm trying to use the laser. I'm focusing that laser to a specific uh, area of the solar cell, such as the grain boundary or the interface, and uh, record uh, a, a, an optical response 
and from that respond, uh, determine the defect properties uh, in the solar cell. Uh, this table uh, summarizes uh, results of, of many measurements. It is not meant to be uh, comprehensive. These are just, just measurements that we've done in, in our laboratory. Uh, and the comparison is made between the single crystal solar cell of gallium arsenide and single crystal cadmium telluride, as well as polycrystalline cadmium telluride, uh, CAGS, castorides, and perovskite. Uh, in this table, I include charge carrier lifetimes, electron mobilities, diffusion length, interface recombination velocities, and in some cases, identification of specific bulk defects. So uh, the lifetimes are great in single crystals. They are radiative. In a sense, they're as high as they could be. Uh, the recombination centers in single um, crystals are effectively eliminated, but single crystals are expensive. The carrier lifetimes in, in cadmium telluride, they approach one microsecond now, and that's a big advantage of, of cadmium selenium telluride versus cadmium telluride. Uh, the carrier lifetimes are also very good in, in CIGS, especially the lower band gap CAGS, and they are extremely uh, high in uh, perovskites. They exceed uh, uh, microseconds. Now, the, the, the mobility is actually um, in, in high in single crystals, but they are very similar in all thin film TME technologies. So, but that means that even if the, if the carrier lifetime is lower, the mobility is still high, uh, which then strongly suggests that the defects that limit mobility are different than defects that limit carrier lifetimes. A diffusion length is the product of mobility and carrier lifetime, and in both cadmium selenium telluride as well as in, in perovskites, these diffusion lengths uh, could, ex could exceed uh, 10 microns, could be in the 15 micron range, because the absorbers are only 2 to 3 micron thick, uh, these diffusion lengths uh, are sufficient for very high efficiency solar cells. Uh, also, these high diffusion lengths mean that both sides of the solar cell need to be passivated very well. The back contact passivation is uh, becoming increase, increasingly important when the carrier diffusion lengths become very high. Recombination velocities are, uh, uh, could be as low as 100 in polycrystalline cat selenium telluride. They are in the order of 1,000 in CIGS, and they could be less than 10 in perovskites. However, in perovskite devi devices, that value is more similar to, to 1,000. And uh, when we know the specific defects that limit uh, uh, carrier lifetimes, um, uh, then um, a good feedback is possible to, 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 to researchers who, who grow the materials. For example, if tellurium antisite, tellurium and cadmium is the recombination center, then by increasing the, the cadmium density by using cadmium overpressure or the higher temperature growth would reduce this kind of defect and would increase, would increase the carrier lifetime. If, for example, the selenium and copper of the vacancies in CHGS are made stable, then the concentration of such defects can be decreased by using additional selenium overpressure, which then would result in lower metastability in this material. It's not easy to identify these defects, but when it's possible, uh, in that case, uh, uh, these are very actionable kind of findings. So I work in a lab, and what we're trying to do, this is kind of the, the, picture, the picture of the, of the experiment that we do, in a sense. We have a laser, we shine the light on the sample, uh, we rest the, the beam over the sample, uh, uh, we record the, the image with this red camera, and we see the, 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 the white field, several hundred micron large field image of the grain boundaries, in the material, once we identify interesting uh, region in this film, then we do slower but time resolved microscopy measurements. Uh, for example, um, the, the illustration on the, on the bottom right it shows time-dependent luminescence as it changes from, from 0.1 nanosecond to 3 nanoseconds, and these uh, dark, dark uh, regions are the increased grain boundary uh, recombination. There is more that is needed in the lab. There is additional equipment that allows us to change um, the, the wavelengths of excitation, temperatures, injection, and other variables, um, important experimental details. 
uh, that enable uh, the detailed study. Now, in addition to, 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 the, to the experiments, we also use modeling. Uh, and uh, the modeling is, 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 is important in, in two ways. Now, first, if we know the grain boundary recombination velocity, then we can calculate uh, what is the impact on the voltage, depending on the bulk lifetime or the grain size in this material. That's a, that's a very important kind of prediction that shows uh, how uh, important or less important that parameter is. Uh, the second uh, um, approach for the, the second area in where we use modeling is actually modeling actual experiments. Like in this case, the, the, the two photon microscopy data measured for cadmium telluride solar cells. Uh, uh, because uh, the, the, solar, the material itself is complex, uh, measurement results depend on, depend on many variables. And the modeling uh, allows us to determine uh, these characteristics, such as the bulk lifetime or the grain boundary recombination velocity. So with that, I will mention three examples. Um, uh, one of them is uh, extended defect and grain boundary microscopy. I, I will show some results for cadmium, telluride, and perovskite. Uh, second is interface passivation, the top and bottom uh, layer passivation. And then the third area is metastability. So uh, the, 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 to illustrate the microscopy, the easiest is to start with a simple, very simple crystalline sample that has only one type of defect, which in this case are stacking faults. Uh, uh, the samples are grown not too far from Austin uh, in, in the lab of, of, of Professor uh, Myers. And uh, if I am able to start this movie, uh, you will see how luminescence is changing over time. So the, the time step in this, in this movie is 0.1 nanosecond. And you see that the size of this dark area is growing in time. Uh, this is because carriers, are drift, uh, carriers drift and diffuse uh, to the extended defect at the center of this image. And this single extended defect impacts recombination over the spatial scale of more than 20 microns. Uh, from the analysis that I will show in the next slide, uh, uh, we can quantify the, 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 the various parameters that describe this recombination. The image, the, yeah, I'm having difficulty with, with my mouse. The, the image on the, on the left is showing the uh, uh, correlative second harmonics uh, image in the sample, which is the optical map and optical image of the space charge field in the sample. Uh, the, the stacking faults are charged. They are surrounded by the depletion region, the space charge field and the depletion region. And this is the, the image. Uh, when uh, we describe that movie data in terms of when we apply image analysis to that, to that uh, data in the previous slide, uh, we see that there are two phases in, in, in this recombination, the fast phase which occurs due to drift, and the slower phase, which occurs due to diffusion. So when this data is put together, we come up with the, grain, with, with the band diagram for the extended defect, which is very similar for the grain boundary diagram, in which we know both the amount of band bending and, and the extent of the band bending and the carrier diffusion length, and get a pretty complete description uh, of, 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 of recombination in this case. When we look at the solar cells, we got these excellent samples from for solar, uh, where uh, we have uh, large grains, um, arsenic doping, so that the doping here is uh, above 10 to the 16s, uh, high, high voltage, and very importantly for this measurement is transparent back contact. Uh, the luminescence graphs on the, the, the luminescence graphs on the right show uh, this time dependent contrast and the linear intensity profile uh, shows how luminescence changes over time. The, the nine uh, dark areas that appear in these images are grain boundary recombination. And uh, when uh, we uh, apply the analytical model for this analysis, we see that the grain boundary recombination uh, is as high as 10 to the fifth. Uh, the overall impact of the bulk recombination, interface recombination, and charge separation in this case is about equal to the grain boundary recombination impact. Uh, now, this probably happens because in this data, which is now a couple of years old, 
the arsenic activation was not very high. It was about 2 to 4%. Uh, there was a lot of unactivated arsenic. Uh, it, it is likely accumulated at the grain boundaries. Uh, and uh, because of that, uh, arsenic-related defects at the grain boundaries were a combination site. Uh, first principle analysis done by Dmitry Krasikov at Forsola suggests that arsenic dimers uh, uh, could be uh, these um, uh, shock leading hole recombination centers at the grain boundaries. Uh, now, not, not all uh, uh, grain boundaries in cadmium telluride are bad. Uh, and not all carrier lifetimes in cadmium telluride are short. Here is a most recent example published last week uh, uh, when the measurement is done on solar cells fabricated at, at for solar. Uh, they are graded absorbers in which uh, the cat selenium telluride is on, on, the, on the glass side, on the top in the cathode luminescence image. Cadmium telluride is at the, at the, at the bottom, at the, at the back contact side. And uh, by this time, I figured out how to do these measurements through thick glass, uh, so the, the special transparent contacts are not needed. And the, the um, uh, two-photon excitation microscopy data uh, shows uh, that the grain boundary contrast is not that high, especially for the cadmium selenium telluride uh, 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 part. Now, if we look at perovskites, then another aspect kind of becomes interesting. If, if we measure lifetimes, the lifetimes not always mean recombination. Uh, lifetimes also, when, when we're doing measurements with a focused laser beam, which is less than one micron in size, uh, the carrier transport, carrier drift and diffusion uh, can also be measured in, in the, in, with, with using the same approach. And here, the, the illustration, so uh, illustration one, shows two bright red grains uh, in, in the middle of the image. Uh, uh, then the uh, image two shows the linear intensity profile. Uh, and then the image three throw, shows uh, the TRPL decays at pixels A, B, C, D, and E. And uh, we developed a simple analytical model that allows us to quantify not only bulk recombination, but also the uh, the diffusion coefficient, the mobility in these cases, and we see that the mobility uh, is not the same inside the grain and between the grains. The, the mobility appears to be higher in between the grains. This might be the effect uh, of, of the grain boundary potentials in perovskite solar cells. This is very active research area. And we do have experimental means to, to, to study these issues. Uh, now the passivation. So why the passivation is important? Uh, as grown, uh, two, uh, six, and three, five semiconductors have uh, high interface defect density and charges. Uh, this uh, reduce minority carrier lifetime. In the case for cadmium telluride, where it would be single crystal, or epitaxial, or polycrystalline to about 100 picoseconds. Very, very short lifetimes, as is shown on the left. Uh, when the measurement is taken in a bulk by focusing light in, light, uh, light in a bulk in the same sample, the lifetimes are a thousand times higher, 100 nanoseconds. So the, the passivation is needed so that the, the near surface electronic properties would be the same as they are in the bulk. Uh, the most uh, successful passivation that is available today for, for uh, thin films, um, uh, for, for cadmium telluride, is by using uh, alumina. So this research was started with Jason Kephart when he was working at, at, at Colorado State University. And the graph on the left uh, shows uh, the, uh, the lifetimes, which are measured for only two micron thick uh, cadmium selenium telluride film. And these microns are close to, these lifetimes are, are close to a microsecond. The time scale of luminescence here exceeds one microsecond. Uh, uh, when the sample thickness is varied uh, and the inverse of the lifetime is plotted, the slope of this graph is the recombination velocity as shown by the formula on the top right. And in this case, recombination velocity is less than 100 in the polycrystalline material, which is about the same as it is in the epitaxial material. So uh, basically, the, the, the passivation 
uh, can be very, very good. Of course, these are insulating samples, so it's a challenge to transfer all of these results into the actual device fabrication, and that is an active research area. But the question, though, is how does it work? And uh, these uh, second harmonic measurements correlated uh, electric field induced second harmonic measurements are very informative in this regard. Because if we look at the uh, passivation for the epitaxial and polycrystalline samples, they have similar recombination velocities, uh, but they appear to have different mechanisms. So the, the, the EFISH signal is very weak in the epitaxial sample in which passivation is, is, is made by uh, epitaxial growth of the lattice match material. In that case, the interface defects and charges are passivated, and there is no near interface electric field. So the, the green signal is very weak. When we measure the polycrystalline materials, however, the, 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 the electric field in the material stays about the same uh, whether the alumina is applied or not. So the, the, which the, the, the alumina passivation appears to be working by the field effect mechanism rather than the, de, uh, rather than the defect passivation mechanism. And being able to measure not only, the, not only photoluminescence intensity and lifetime, but also the, the, the field strength in the same correlative measurement is actually very useful in, in, in being able to understand uh, the, the mechanisms of passivation, whether that would be with alumina or would be in, in um, some other material systems. So finally, metastability. Uh, the, the, it's, it's a very top, important topic in which you know, we, we, we uh, um, want to contribute understanding long-term long -term performance of, of, of solar cells. Uh, I, I use example from CIGS, cobrindium gallium selenide, because uh, the metastability issues in CIGS are very well documented. So the graph on the right is, is taken from the NREL website, and it's taken from Solar Frontier uh, to the NREL website, which shows that uh, over the duration of days, uh, the uh, module power output uh, uh, can change. So we did this research uh, in collaboration with researchers at NREL as well as uh, researchers at, at Mayo Soleil. The NREL um, um, CIGS is grown in a three-stage process on, on glass substrates. They are beautiful grain. Uh, the, the, the solar cells, CIGS solar cells grown at Mayo Soleil, they are grown on, on flexible steel substrates uh, to enable different applications. The data on the left is from the Myosolea, where the capacitance voltage C shows what happens during the light soaking, and then dark heat treatment, in that the carrier density changes by close to an order of magnitude. And, and that is one of the manifestations of this metastability, which is reversible, uh, and the devices can be cycled many times from the lower doped and higher doped state. Uh, the, in the, the, the figures, the pictures, illustrations on the right uh, show the explanation developed by Stefan Lani and Alex Zanger at NREL for this effect uh, quite some time ago, uh, uh, where the, the, from the first principles analysis, these researchers identified that it's a copper and selenium day vacancies uh, are the metastable defects. Uh, they could be in plus or the minus states. Uh, and uh, they transition between these plus and minus states because of exposure to light. And, and, and uh, one of these states, um, the minus state has higher doping, but also shorter lifetime. Uh, the plus state uh, is the one where you get this in, 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 in after being in, in the dark. Uh, the cartoon made by Lelani and Zunger has this orange arrow which suggests an experiment how you can verify the presence of, 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 of this feature in that one needs to use the, the light that is less than the band gap and uh, directly measure the, the transition uh, uh, to this um, uh, the plus the vacancy state. Uh, more recently, Stefan Lani has repeated these calculations using the modern first principles methods uh, and uh, uh, found that the depth of that sub, sub band gap state should be about 200 uh, uh, millivolts. 
And this is what we found in, in experiments in the lab in that when we uh, tune the, the, the excitation energy below the band gap, uh, we can record the excitation spectrum or just really just the absorption spectrum uh, of this metastable day vacancy state, uh, which is as predicted, uh, about 200 milli electron volts uh, below, the, the, below the conduction band. Um, uh, this is a pretty general observation in that we can look at uh, CIGS grown in a three-stage process uh, um, with or without alkali treatments at the, with, for the CIGS band gap of about 1.1 EV or 1.5 EV, and these defects are still observed and, and present and can, can be quantified with the excitation spectroscopy. They are also seen in CIGS that has the silver, an addition of silver to CIGS of uh, it, it's a kind of a recent development that offers uh, important advantages. It, it's a slightly bigger band gap, so it's slightly better overlap with the, with the solar spectrum, as well as uh, somewhat different crystal growth. It allows to grow uh, larger grains uh, using a simpler manufacturing process. And, and the silver CAG is actually now a, a part of, of commercial uh, product. But these metastable states are there and because we can measure them and we can assign them to, to, to selenium and copper day vacancies, the, the selenization of the absorber film allows uh, the, the CAGS material scientists to, to reduce and to control uh, this metastable defect density. So it, it was a very nice result to be able to provide these kinds of metrology tests uh, done in non-destructive, uh, contactless, uh, and in some cases, rapid measurements. So here is my one sentence summary of this presentation. Uh, terawatt KLPV requires efficient and reliable solar cells enabled by semiconductor defect and device engineering. Uh, uh, in addition to the annual efficiency chart, which is on the left, uh, the, the, the electro-optical property chart on the right is uh, pretty useful in trying to understand the, the current status of the technology, uh, the, the current limitations, as well as the opportunities for improvement, uh, and even the, the, the assignment of, of the lifetimes, mobilities, and interface recombination velocities, in some cases, to a specific, to a specific defect. I want to, to, to thank my, my colleagues who helped in this work. They are PV characterization scientists at Enreal, uh, uh, cadmium telluride researchers at Enreal, at First Solar, at Colorado State, at Texas State, um, uh, as well as the, the collaborators uh, in the Cattel Passivation Project, um, CAGS researchers at Enreal and Maisole, and Ohio State, as well as the perovskite researchers at Enreal. Uh, and uh, with that, uh, thank you uh, very much. Great, thank you so much, uh, Darius. Um, uh, oh, if, if anyone has any questions uh, at this point, please feel free to uh, to type them into the chat window, or uh, you're also uh, able to turn on your microphone and, and answer them, or, or excuse me, ask them that way if you. My mouse is not working very well. I'm trying to. No problem. If 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 you if you can't see the uh, uh, the questions in the chat window, I can I can always dictate them to you. Uh, I'm up there. Okay. Yes. So it's a question from Pascal. What exactly do you mean that alumina passivates via the field effect mechanism? Well, uh, uh, what, what the measurement shows is that there is a strong space charge field uh, at the cattle surface. Whether that would be grown, uh, uh, whether that would be polycrystalline or single crystal material, that's a very general observation uh, that comes from the from the positive charge at the surface, which introduces the band bending. 
and the flow of electron attraction to the interface. Um, when alumina is grown, and I mean the good alumina with all the treatments when that increases lifetimes, uh, that space charge field it more or less appears to be the same as taken from the optical measurement. Now, the optical measurement analyzes material uh, within the first 100 nanometers. That is, I cannot say what happens at, at, at the several atomic layers. I cannot say what happens in the first 3 nanometers, which is kind of the scale in which XPS and surface analysis studies are done. But overall, over the depths of 100 nanometers, the space charge field and the band bending near interface appears to be the same. This is different from the epitaxial case in which the, the space charge field is eliminated. So that would be my, my understanding of, of, of the, of the um, second harmonic measurements for the alumina passivated cathode. So, Jibo is asking, is talk available for distribution? Uh, I need to get annual approval for that, uh, but I think that John will, will make a recording and, and will post it. I certainly don't mind. Yes, uh, so Brian Davis, your presentation was technology agnostic. Do you have a type to prepare to work with? I, I can't, you know, I work with all. <laughs> uh, but uh, what it appears is that um, we also, I also work with, with exotic materials, new materials, uh, whereas the kind of perhaps the focus is science. All the materials that I mentioned, they are technology, uh, which is very useful, and it is only the scaling issues and these other aspects, investments, that more or less probably determine what, what gets used. Okay. Uh, well, if we don't have any other questions, then uh, um, then we'll uh, we'll go ahead and, and let uh, let Darius go. But uh, in in terms of as he said, yes, we'll we'll have a video um, or we should have a video posted. We we I have to run this by the NREL comms team to just make sure that uh, there's nothing in it that they're um, uh, you know that they wouldn't like disclosed. But uh, uh, once they've approved uh, the posting, then I'll get it up on our YouTube channel, and uh, we've got. Um, uh, some other talks, uh, quite a few other talks in the series there if you've never visited. So, um, so again, thank you very much, Darius, for your time. We, uh, we really appreciate you uh, taking, uh, taking the time to, uh, to speak with us and, um, uh, and hope to hear from you again uh, sometime in the future. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank Thanks, everyone.